Please welcome our esteemed panel of entrepreneurs. Looney Libis, serial entrepreneur and founder, Fledge. David Nilsson, co-founder and CEO, Guidant Financial. Dave Parker, Vice President, UP Global. Andy Schauber, partner, Summit Law Group. Daniel Todd, CEO and founder, Affinity Influencing Systems. And moderator, Connie Borassa Shaw, director of the Burke Center for Entrepreneurship. Hi, my name is Daniel Todd. I'm the CEO of Affinity Influencing Systems. Uh, we started the company last May. Um, I woke up in the morning about 9 a.m. And, and registered the domain. Uh, I went and played basketball and at noon I came back and met with my first investor who invested $25,000. When I closed my first a little bit of chunk of money, uh, I really tried to raise as little as I needed to get to an, an, the, my next milestone. So when I raised the first chunk, my milestone was hire a co-founder, get him up on to speed on the business and determine what it is that you could actually build. Um, as soon as I did that, then I had enough proof of concept to go raise another $75,000 and then that helped me get the product out to market, show that I actually had potential partners, prove the distribution model, prove the revenue model, and then that started to, to lead to me able to raise a quarter million dollars. And so all along I've been able to kind of take risk out of the business, prove the different fundamentals until most recently I raised about $400,000. And my hope is of course that now I've, I've proven that I can take this to you know, tens of millions of dollars a year, and ideally hundreds of millions of dollars a year in revenue, and then I can gain the confidence of VCs. Welcome everyone, we're delighted to have you here with us this morning to talk about Startup Start Here. I'm Connie Barassa Shaw from the University of Washington and I'm the director of the Entrepreneurship Center. Um, we have five entrepreneurs here to talk with us about two things to start with. First of all, we want to talk about why Seattle is such a great city for entrepreneurship. Um, we do have a rare position in being one of the top cities around the United States for early stage companies. The second thing we're going to talk about is what you're here for, which is finding out what are the methods by which early stage entrepreneurs should be thinking about money, raising money, thinking about st smart money, right? So before we get started, I'd like to ask you, how many of you are in the thinking about it stage? Okay. And how many of you have started companies? Sweet. Okay, then you're going to know a lot about what we're talking about here. Okay, so let's begin with Seattle, which is often called the third greatest city in the country for starting companies. Uh, usually we're behind Silicon Valley Bank. Silicon Valley Bank. Oh, they'll <laughs> love this. Um, Silicon Valley as well as Boston. Um, but there's lots of us in Seattle who think we're really number two. And so it's a great place to start a company. So when you look at what has to happen in the community to have it be a great place for entrepreneurs, there are generally eight things that people look at. The first thing is, is this, does this city have a history of scrappy entrepreneurs? And so we think about pioneers versus settlers. I mean, you think about the people who are willing to take chances, who aren't satisfied with the status quo. The other thing that you look at is, is there, are there the research powerhouses here that produce the technologies that people can then commercialize? And so, of course, there's the University of Washington, there's PNNL on the eastern side of the state, but there's also a number of other research institutes in Seattle. The third thing is the infrastructure that supports early stage entrepreneurship. For example, in Seattle, we've got the Northwest Entrepreneur Network, Founders Institute, Startup Weekend, as well as the industry associations like the WBBA and the WTIA, as well as the financial services firms, that the professional service firms that make it easy for early stage entrepreneurs to get going. You also need an educated workforce. And so there's a, there's a deep talent pool in Seattle, and that has been a major advantage for us. The other thing is sources of funding, and I'm not just talking about VC money, but I'm also talking about angel investors as well as alternatives to funding. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. You need a business climate that supports entrepreneurs. And so Washington State is actually number five or number six in the country in terms of tax measures for entrepreneurs. Uh, you need a media that talks about early stage entrepreneurship. 
And so the, what is the number one thing an entrepreneur needs? They need to be able to talk about what they're doing. They need to be able to gain visibility, visibility for their companies. And so in Seattle, we've got TechFlash, GeekWire, Xconomy. They're all there to talk about early stage companies and what they're doing. And then the last thing that you really need are anchor tenants. And we call anchor tenants those companies that are started, in, that are headquartered in the city, that spin out entrepreneurs, they spin out ideas. And so we've got, of course, Microsoft and Boeing, but we've also got retail innovation leaders like Amazon and Costco and REI and Nordstrom. Nordstrom, I think, is interesting in that it calls itself a 113-year-old startup. So, now I want the panel to help me to, to give some um, details to what I've just been talking about. So Dave Parker, I'm going to start with you. Mm -hmm. um, Dave is with Up Global, which is Startup Weekend and Startup America. And you've been part of the entrepreneurial ecosystem for a very long time. Yep. And so one of the mantras for startups is, you know, fail early and fail fast. Can you tell me how the ecosystem helps entrepreneurs get their ideas right from the very beginning? Yeah, so, so I've been fortunate enough to start five companies over the last 15 years, and uh, about five months ago, I actually joined a, a global nonprofit based here in Seattle called Up Global that helps launch entrepreneurship. So we look at not just the ecosystem in Seattle, but the ecosystem globally for startups and what makes those things uh, important and, and work. So I think that one of the first things I'd start off with is just access to, to programming and content that that's, fits where you're at mm -hmm. and where you are in your own entrepreneur journey. Because where, you know, some of you are like, we're just thinking about it. And what you need on the just thinking about it stage is, you know, what's the, what's the things I need to do before I spend money on stuff I shouldn't be spending money on? And what mm -hmm. I always tell people is, you can go buy office furniture, but that doesn't actually help your business. And it feels like business, but it's not. And so getting the right programming access and, you know, there's, there's meetups, there's events, there's chances to network um, with people who can help you with the internal of the business, for example, as co-founders or, mm -hmm. or resources. But there's also uh, programming like Startup Weekend, we're running 176 of those over the next two weekends um, globally. And it's just a program to help you find out if, hey, is a is startup really for me uh, or not? Uh, and then once you decide it's for you, there's things like NWIN, and you know Seattle Tech Meetup, and you don't have to be exclusively in tech in Seattle right. to find those resources. There's a lot of resources. Enwin, for example, has a First Look Forum, and the First Look Forum is a program that you, you go through that gives, it's a first look for investors to actually look at startups in the earliest stages. So they don't expect you to be you know, a huge amount of revenue, but they, expect you, they do expect you to have been out and talked to customers and have actually customers validated that the idea you have in your head actually works. So I think your point when you're talking on the video about we did this and we lowered the risk and then we raised some capital and we did this and we lowered the risk. Mm -hmm. All of those things had to do with customer validation and I would tell you that's one of the first things from an investor standpoint. And, but there's lots of resources to help you find those. And so as probably many of you know, you should never be afraid of pitching your idea. You should pitch it all the time because it's practice, it's a test, it falls exactly into what you're talking about. Yeah, Dan Shapiro, who's, I think he sold a company in like three days to Google uh, a couple <laughs> years ago. Dan says that ideas die from lack of exposure, not from overexposure. And if you've ever gone to somebody and said, I want you to sign a non-disclosure before I tell you your idea, just total rookie mistake. Um, you need to find out if people actually care about your idea, you should talk to everybody about it. Exactly. Okay, so I'm going to skip down to Looney, who is a, another key player in the Seattle entrepreneurial community. And he's working mostly in social entrepreneurship, or what we're now calling impact entrepreneurship. So Looney, talk about the kind of support and encouragement that, for example, Impact Hub Seattle and Fledge are having for those entrepreneurs. All right. Uh, thanks, Connie. Um, so I made the jump over. I'm actually a 20-year software entrepreneur. Uh, Fledge is my sixth startup. Uh, and in that jump over the wall into social good, into businesses that do good and, and do good business at the same time, uh, I found a huge hole in the amount of help that those companies had. And it's the same hole as every company that's not software. Right? Uh, this, this city is a great entrepreneurial city, uh, but almost all of the resources out there, almost all the infrastructure is targeted toward helping software companies. And yes, NWEN's one of the exceptions, University of Washington is one of the exceptions. Um, but, um, you know, but the big meetups and whatnot, they're around tech. Uh, so mm -hmm. to fix that, a bunch of us decided to purposely build the infrastructure to help conscious companies, to help impact companies, whatever you want to call this, this space. Uh, one such place is called Impact Hub Seattle. 
It's part of a global co-op of similar spaces. They're uh, not just co-working spaces. It's not just about selling seats to people who want to work. It's about building a community. In the past year, we've gotten 600 people to join our community. Uh, we're in one building down in Pioneer Square, mm -hmm. and it's the uh, largest of its type in North America. Uh, it is uh, not just Impact Hub Seattle, that's two floors of the building, but we also have Social Venture Partners, which is a large venture philanthropy group. Yet another global network uh, started in Seattle. Uh, and then on the uh, top floor of the building is the Bainbridge Graduate Institute, which is an 11-year-old business school that's been teaching sustainable business. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about infrastructure pieces, that's our equivalent of the University of Washington. That's our research institution um, for sustainable business, mm -hmm. uh, all in the same building. Uh, and then one more piece that was missing in there was the business accelerator, it was the equivalent of Techstars, the equivalent of Y Combinator, uh, the, the founder institute of the, of the space. And so I created that. It's called Fledge. Uh, and it's set up in the same manner as Techstars. Lots of companies apply from around the world, most of them Seattle. Uh, and we work with them for 10 weeks. Uh, and that wasn't enough either, so I started a second program over the summer called Kick. Uh, that was inclusive to anyone who applied. Again, we supplied uh, eight weeks of help to anybody who wanted help to get their companies off the ground, to test out ideas, uh, and to do this for this particular corner of, of entrepreneurship where they're mission-driven companies. Right. And so we, we found the mentors, we found them some funding, and, uh, and we're helping them get in going. Okay, great. So let's skip down to Dave now of Guidant Financial. Guidant has funded, helped to finance 8,500 entrepreneurs with nearly $3 billion in capital. But you've also co-written a book, and that book talks about um, entrepreneurs being emotionally ready to become entrepreneurs and to start companies. And so I really want to ask Dave about those considerations, because a lot of CEOs, first-time CEOs and founders of companies, will tell you that it's lonely when you're doing this. I mean, who do you have to really count on and, and what resources do you have? And so let's talk about the Seattle ecosystem in terms of that part. Sure, well, um, you know, I will say from uh, my perspective, we started our business 10 years ago and we did it bootstrap. So never took on any debt, didn't take any financing in uh, and built it organically. So, um, you know, I was excited to start the business and quickly found out that I love entrepreneurship. Uh, but I don't think I was actually ready for some of the emotional considerations, which is why we wrote the book to help people answer that question, am I an entrepreneur? Um, there's really three things that I thought would be worth talking about, because I know we have a, a, an audience that's varying between uh, thinking about starting a business and, uh, and then already in business. But uh, the first few that I could think of first was uh, just financial instability. Um, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're the first one to pay, but you're also the last one to get, get paid. paid. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't think a lot of people consider that going into this, because oftentimes as an entrepreneur, you're concerned about how you're going to get your next paycheck or even make your next payroll. Uh, and that's a huge amount of stress that can wear a lot on the individual. So one thing to consider is whether or not that's something that you're capable of dealing with day in and day out. Um, and if, if that is something that is a concern of yours, there are other business models, not just an entrepreneurial startup where you're starting something from scratch, but things like buying an existing business or even starting a franchise that can mitigate um, those risks. Um, the second is the time investment. Um, I saw a quote the other day that I absolutely identified with. It says, entrepreneurs will work 80 hours a week to avoid working 40. And, <laughs> and I think if you own a business, you understand that. The time investment is absolutely massive. Um, one thing that I always coach new entrepreneurs on, though, is trying to figure out how they adjust the business to meet their needs as an individual, to help them work in their own genius zone, so that the things that they're working on are giving them energy, not taking it away from them. Uh, so at the end of the day, they still have energy left to give to their family and their passions outside right. of work. Uh, and to the extent that you can, I know as a new business owner, oftentimes you're cheap cook and uh, bottle washer. Um, but as the business starts to evolve, making sure that you're building a team around you that allows you to focus on the things uh, are super important. Uh, but lastly, uh, to Connie's point, being an entrepreneur is lonely. Uh, when you are the business owner uh, and you're successful, whether that's real or imagined, um, it is lonely. Your friends and your family don't relate to the same problems that you're having. And I think that's one of the things that Seattle has done a phenomenal job of. In fact, I would advocate that Seattle, uh, given the fact that we work with thousands of entrepreneurs every single year to help them find financing, I would say that Seattle, more than any place in the country, has built a more open and transparent um, and inclusive entrepreneurial culture. 
uh, and you'll see organizations for every life cycle of a business. So as startups, there's, you know, there's Up Global, there's Founders Institute, there's Techstars, and then as the business matures, there's things like Vistage and EO and YPO that really help to build community right. uh, and allow those entrepreneurs to learn and grow together. Great. Okay, so Daniel, let's go to you. You're the case study here. Okay. So let's talk about how you've been able to network in the Seattle ecosystem and how that has paid off for you. Sure, so I'd say I'm not a natural networker, so I don't like to go to these big events and I, I, I wouldn't go naturally up and talk to mm -hmm. people. So the way I started uh, four or five years ago is I, I signed up for Poker 2.0, which is a, a startup <laughs> poker event. And uh, you can get the list on Eventbrite. And so I went through and I looked up every single person that was an entrepreneur. I cross-referenced them on LinkedIn to see wow. how many people I knew. And there was one particular guy, Nick Kazar of OfferUp, who I had like 13 friends. I'm like, how do I not know this guy? So I sent him an email and said, hey, let's go to coffee. And so I'm just getting back into things. I had taken a few years off from starting my first company. And, and we met. And that came out of that, a group called 1 plus 1 equals 4, which is sort of meaningful one-hour conversations over coffee where you kind of get to know how you can help that other person. Um, and he's like, I really liked your idea of doing this. Like, we should introduce each other to other people. I'm like, I don't remember that idea, but that sounds great. <laughs> 90 days later, I had had 22 coffees and mm -hmm. had met with 22 other entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And I can say that from that group of people, probably 75% of the funding that I've raised and probably 50% of the business development deals that I've done have come from that network of people, because they know what I need, I know what they need, um, they're liking the things that I post on Facebook, I'm making introductions to them, and so, and then that just, once you have that core, that just grows very quickly, because then you're, you know, I, I try to keep up with each one of them once a year, or twice a year, go to coffee, um, and it's just been very meaningful, and then, even though I'm not a very good networker in my perspective, then everybody thinks I'm a great networker, because I know everybody, because now, you know, five years down the road, I've now met, I've had hundreds of coffees with individuals, which I find is far more meaningful than just shaking hands and exchanging cards at, a, at an event. So those events are good. I go to those events, but I usually try to just meet one person and, you know, connect to them and, and remember them and then follow up with them in the future, so. Sure, and that, it is hard sometimes to do entrepreneur events um, and to go and have meaningful conversations. So. Having coffee really works. Yep. Um, so Andy, I want to touch back with you. Andy is with Summit Law, which was itself a very entrepreneurial law firm in terms of when they first formed. And so one of the things that I often say to student startups, for sure, is having a good attorney at the beginning will save you a lot of time, money, heartache, everything else. So talk about what you tell people who come to see you about what they need to know in terms of not making mistakes, getting out there networking, not being afraid of visibility, that kind of thing. Sure. Uh, so, you know, whenever I talk to a client about any kind of legal issue, uh, I start with getting a sense of what the client's goals are uh, and then what mm -hmm. their expectations are with respect to their business uh, and then craft a legal solution around that. Uh, so for a startup business, whether you're an entrepreneur or you're a seasoned uh, business owner, uh, you want to have very clear goals. Uh, for a startup, you want to think about your exit strategy. Uh, do, you, uh, do you plan on passing your business along to your kids? Uh, do you plan on selling your business in five years to uh, a, strategic, a strategic partner? Uh, another thing to think about is um, do, you, uh, do you plan on your business being a lifestyle business? Uh, do you plan on opening up a brick and mortar company? Uh, do you plan on being a technology company and, uh, and, and growing, being very high growth? So those are, all, those are all things to think about in terms of your goals. Uh, for expectations, your expectations are gonna be centered around you know, what is your fundraising strategy? Who are the folks that you're gonna approach uh, to raise money? Not, not all businesses are, are gonna find very good partners in VCs, uh, mm -hmm. for example, and, and you should be realistic about that. Um, uh, you also wanna have a good sense of what your revenue picture is. Are you gonna be earning money from, uh, from day one uh, and able to sustain your business without needing a whole lot of capital? Or are you gonna need $5 million in 24 months to be able to ship your first product? Uh, that'll all go into kind of what the legal, legal structure turns out to be. Uh, and then with respect to the legal structure, you know, it's not just LLC versus corp. Uh, right. That's what, what a lot of people focus on, but it's other things, you know, tax considerations, uh, intellectual property protections, uh, and you, you know, other things about uh, where, where you want the, uh, the company to go. So, you know, to echo what you said, uh, 
meet with your, your counsel that you trust and you know uh, early on and, uh, and meet with them often because, uh, because it's an invaluable resource. Right. So to all of you, I would just say, you know, make sure that you have trust and respect for any professional service provider who you've got on your team. Um, let's go to money now, because I think that's part of why you're here. And so, Daniel, I want to go back to you. And you were at Zango, which you took to number seven on the Inc. 500 list of fastest growing companies. And now you're working with Affinity. So tell us how long you were able to bootstrap before you took in equity investments. At, at Zango, we uh, bootstrapped for about 90 days. Uh -huh. um, a lot of us had, had quit one company and had, had 90 days, and we were able to write, literally as the bubble was bursting, raise a million dollars from a strategic investor that they themselves were out of business 90 days later. Um, <laughs> then we more or less really struggled for the next 24 months. Um, but that struggling was, I think, a good thing. We had tried to sell the, I mean, we tried to sell the company. We tried to get out of it. We weren't smart enough to go home. Uh, and eventually we started making money and slowly sort of after 9-11 and as the bubble had been uh, coming back, uh, we really didn't ever raise money again until we were profitable. We eventually mm -hmm. took uh, $40 million off from private equity, but we didn't have to fund the company beyond that million dollars, which didn't actually help us fund. Um, but we did that not because we wanted to. We tried to raise money at, at, um, at Affinity. I, you know, the idea was three hours old and I raised my first $25,000. So, but I did that by design. I didn't have the economic resources uh, to, to bootstrap for myself. And so I raised enough to, to give me time to raise another, to, to bring on another team and um, another team member rather and, and go from there. So that was by design. I know I was giving up equity, but the people I was partnering with were also strategic partners who are helping make introductions. And uh -huh. so, it was well worth that. So. Okay, and this, the introductions are really useful. Oh yeah. So I mean, yeah. you, you needless know, to say, I, I'm a big fan of people trying to. If you don't know what your business model is, uh -huh. and, you, and you're going to need a lot of opportunities to possibly wiggle around and, and pivot, um, you want to take as little money as you can until you kind of dial in. But right. I was doing a repeat of a business model that I already knew, sort of an improvement on that. Uh -huh. So I was very confident, which is why I could gain investors' trust more quickly. Um, but it was also very less like you know. I wasn't going to be pivoting. Like this was the model. It was certainly going to improve over time, but um, if I was starting brand new with an idea that I hadn't worked on before, I would try to get six months in before I tried to raise money, not three hours in. So yeah, three hours is amazing, by the way. <laughs> it was, uh, it it was, was a lucky, lucky day. Exactly, so. exactly. Okay, so Dave, um, Guidant <coughs> funded 1,600 businesses in the last year, and you've also, you're also an angel investor, so you've seen a lot of presentations. So talk to us about what are the key attributes of a good investor presentation. Oh, man. Well, so I, I guess I should clarify, uh, Guidance Financial did help 1,600 people find financing yeah. last year, but we don't directly invest in those businesses. We help them um, find traditional funding sources, then also do things like invest their retirement assets in their own businesses. Um, but I do invest in a lot of local startups, and I've seen a lot of presentations. Um, you know, I think the biggest things that I look for are some of the things that you, you would probably assume. You know, the first is, uh, is there a true need for the product and service um, or the, the uh, offering? Um, is it in a, an industry or a, a sector where there's big growth or expected to be um, a lot of momentum? Uh, and then, of course, the team that the, the entrepreneur is surrounding themselves with. Um, but, in fact, actually, um, there's a lot of people that... Um, uh, I think said that they, they already owned a business. How many of you wrote a business plan or have written a business plan before? Okay, keep your hands up. Um, uh, those of you that wrote a business plan and then actually launched the business, how many of you were absolutely right, dead on perfect with all of your assumptions and the hands go down, <laughs> right? So um, one, of the, you know, <laughs> one of the um, big um, mentors in my life actually early on was Dave Parker here at the end. And one of the things that he told me at the very beginning was once you write a business plan, it's wrong. And that's exactly what I found with every business I've ever invested in. And so what I, the, the number one reason I invest in a business is because I believe in the entrepreneur. And I believe that they have enough passion um, and uh, experience and competency to see themselves through the changes and challenges that they are inevitably going to face in their business. Um, so at the end of the day, what I want to see from an entrepreneur is someone who's really thought through what the opportunity is, what the space looks like. Um, but it's checked their ego and recognizes that they're going to have to morph and adapt um, with that business. Sure. Okay, 
So Andy, let's get back to you and talk about early stage companies have to be ready for investment. So from a legal point of view, would you tell us what that means? Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, you know, when a, a client comes in and they're, we're having this conversation about what they can do to prepare for fundraising, and preferably it's, uh, I'm the first person they talk to, and, or if not, maybe the second. Uh, yeah. uh, and, uh, and I can walk them through the process. But process is very time consuming. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very energy draining. Uh, you're going to have, a, uh, have to have a attention to detail that you've never had to have before. And chances are, if you're a tech founder, you uh, probably don't have a high level of it. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, it, it's very important to know that you're going to have to answer a lot of questions uh, from investors that you probably don't want to have to answer and give them information that you might not have to. Disclosure is, is incredibly important. Um, you're going to have to spend money. You're going to have to spend money to, to, to raise money, and that's, uh, you should have a really clear budget about, uh, about how much you can spend on that process. Uh, and, you know, I, I keep saying it, but... Uh, you know, you have to have a, uh, a pretty, pretty clear strategy about, you know, what type of investor that you're, uh, you're reaching out to before you start thinking about, uh, about the term sheet. Uh, so having realistic expectations about that process is really important. Okay, so let's continue that talk about expectations. And Looney, let's talk about Fledge and the other accelerators that are around Seattle. What are the entrepreneurs' expectations when they come out of a three or six month accelerator? And what are the investors' expectations of those companies? Uh, okay, um, I'd say they're not quite the same. <laughs> uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of uh, companies apply to these programs. We have uh, four, uh, three-month accelerators in the city. Uh, Techstars, Techstars Seattle, Microsoft Accelerator, run, which has been run by Techstars. Uh, Nine Mile Labs, which is now focused on B2B companies, Fledge. Uh, and then we also have Founder Institute uh, and a bunch of others that are um, a little lighter weight. Uh, I think the expectation of everyone who applies to any of these is that they will be uh, in the market, up and running, and funded by the time they get done. Mm -hmm. right? That when the demo day comes around, they uh, give their pitch to the investors, and a bunch of checks get left on the on the stage. Uh, and then, I don't think I don't know if they've thought past that. Right? That's the that's the end end game for them. Uh, and the reality is that even with the the best of these programs, that's not where they get. So a few of the companies get there; they're funded before before it's over. Um, those are the high flying companies with the best teams, best ideas, biggest opportunities. Uh, the rest of them have a really good business plan. Um, it's still wrong, uh, uh, but it's a really good business plan. And what I, what I mean by that is that they know why they put those numbers down. They know why uh, they've chosen that customer segment and that price point and whatnot. And they've looked at hundreds of other opportunities, hundreds of other possibilities. Uh, and that makes for a great business plan because then when plan B comes around in a month, you've already thought of that. And when Plan C comes around in three months, well, you've already thought of that too. And as new ideas show up, you're used to um, fitting in new ideas and taking more feedback and updating that plan. Sure. Um, so that, that's really what people are getting out of this is, is a rock solid direction to go and uh, knowledge on how to go and get there. Right. Okay, so Dave, let's, let's end this discussion, this part of the discussion yeah. with you. Um, so one of the things that will, will kill a deal faster than anything else is when the entrepreneur has way overly ambitious ideas about how far they can be in six months, um, <laughs> let alone a couple years. So how do entrepreneurs make sure that they are right-sized? How do they make sure that the pitch that they're going to give to an investor is really right on? I mean, you want to be optimistic, but you don't want to be grandiose. And you certainly don't want to look yeah. like you're a shrinking violet, but at the same time, if you are ego-driven, you're dead in the water. So there's, there's, a, there's lots of outliers on the bad side, so we'll hit just a few of them. But I think the first thing I would warn you about or give you an expectation is, is your need for capital and your ability to raise capital are two different things. <laughs> right? So your need for capital was, I needed, uh, this is what I needed to have done. Your ability to raise capital is different. And I have a lot of folks who come through, and I run, help run the Founders to program here locally, a lot of people come through and it's like, well, but Dave, you don't understand. I need capital, and that's why I'm going to go talk to venture capitalists this afternoon. And that's just like an epic fatal flaw, right? Because you need to have traction and momentum and a product and customer validation 
Those are things you need to have checked off the list before you talk to somebody about capital, other than the friends, families, and commonly called fools list, right, which is the people you're going to be sharing Thanksgiving with in two weeks. But keep in mind, you have to share next Thanksgiving with them as well, right? So um, I see a lot of financial models. People get to $100 million in the end of year five. By the way, if you get to $40 million in the end of year five, it gets you to the top of the Inc. 500 list in the top five over the last eight years. Mm -hmm. So getting to 40 million in revenue in five years is a big number. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of stuff around y your ambition, and it's good that you're ambitious and you, you've got a big goal and a big dream, but there's also data out there. Your idea is unique, your business model isn't unique. And your business model has benchmark data of other companies like your business that has conversion numbers, that has average revenue per user numbers, it has churn numbers, it has growth numbers. You need to go back and find that and be more well-versed in that than the people you're talking to. Right. Because when they say, those numbers are unrealistic, you can say, no, actually, here's three companies who did something similar, and we're copying their business model. All right, our business idea is unique, but the model's not unique. And that plays in your asset as long as you're aware of it. If you're not aware of it, it totally slays you with investors because they are aware of it. Right. And that's just a downfall for you. Right. Okay, so we have a few minutes left, and I want to get some takeaways for the audience here from you guys. So really quickly, let's each give one to-do that you should not fail on, and one thing that you should not do if you're an early stage entrepreneur. So Dave, go. Uh, so team, uh, I would say the team extends to legal, it extends to your co-founders. If you don't have a team in place, if you if you anticipate any desire of getting funding, you need to have a team in place because investors don't found, found solo entrepreneurs. So that's both the plus and the minus. So if you're solo, awesome, it's a lifestyle business, you can do that, you don't need a team, but if you have any anticipation of getting funding, you have to have a team and you need to go put that in place. Okay. I would echo what Dave said about having your financial model. Like Nothing helps talking to anybody uh, better than knowing how you grow, how you shrink, how you make money down pat. And I've talked to a lot of companies where I ask them what their core metrics are, and they're like, What's, what are core metrics? And so that is not an answer that you want to give. And so take the time to put together a, as detailed as you can spreadsheet and talk to people, because like D Dave said, there's no business model that's really totally brand new. So you can get help. There's existing spreadsheets, and it will just let you think about your business more specifically around the, the goals and the numbers that you need to accomplish. OK, I'll, I'll take one step back from there. Um, uh, be suspicious from all the positive feedback you get as you go around and share your idea. Uh, so you will get, uh, you know, if you have a really good idea, most everyone will say that's a really good idea. Uh, go and test it out with some prices on it, right? Mm -hmm. you know, make a mock-up, make a screenshot, just make a sketch. Uh, show, them, show the next person what you think you're going to do and ask them would they pay $500 for it. Uh, and then you'll find out that you'll start to get more no's than you had yeses. And then as you go along, try and make it more and more real. Will you pre-buy this now? All right. mm -hmm. uh, is it worth $500? Can you pre-buy it for $250 right now? All right. And then you'll find out that you have one or two or three percent yeses. And that will get you to the numbers you can plug in the spreadsheet, and that will get you to the excitement of the team if it's actually something people want. Get a good night's sleep. <laughs> As a new parent, I know that uh, I can do anything if I've had a good night's sleep. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. I actually was echoing team, too, but she yeah. did. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I would just say um, find a couple of people that you really trust and volunteer to be a punching bag. Um, sort of in line with what you were just saying, the, most people will tell you that they love the idea if they have close relationships and they don't want to hurt your feelings. Um, but I do coffee with probably two or three entrepreneurs a week where they're talking about the ideas and asking for real candid feedback. Does this seem like it makes sense? Am I pointing in the right direction? Does this pricing model make sense to you? I mean, just all sorts of things. Find some people that you trust are going to give you good feedback because um, what you want is the right idea, um, not a bunch of yes, yes people around you. So in conclusion, develop your network, use your network, count on your network. <laughs> <laughs> Have I said network enough here? OK, thank you. Uh, from all of us to all of you, hey, congratulations, you've made a good step. And we say, uh, not to paraphrase Nike, but just do it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.